Okay, guys, so you heard I mentioned before that uh, Dave Murphy's been planning this uh, F5J contest, and it, I, I didn't realize it was part of the U.S. tour of F5J. F5J. Um, and um, it's going to be, there might even be several contests here at Brigantino, so it's a really big deal to have some people coming perhaps from all over the country to, to fly in this contest. So we thought we should have a, a talk about this subject about a month before the contest. The, the contest is uh, July 14th, it's a Saturday, 8 to 3, um, and it's about a half day on Sunday, which is the 15th, and then there's even a practice day on the day on the Friday before, I think that's the 13th. So just mark your calendars, and it'll probably be a good uh, spectator sport too to see the F5Js launch. I take it, how big a group do you think will be there? Well, if it's, a, <clears throat> if it's really US tour, maybe 50 people. 50 people, yeah. so it's a, it's a real big deal. It's like Las Vegas. Um, so just to talk about it, we're, we're gonna, I, I, I could get Dave to talk, and so I, I picked second choice as Francesco, <laughs> which is one of my go-to guys, usually on a technical, very technical subject. He's talked about batteries, and he's talked about F5J type things before, but um, we're actually quite lucky to have him. He's probably you're one of the best competitors, probably from this this local area. So it's it's quite a good good thing to have an expert on it. And also, he's going to be talking about um, how to retrofit planes, how to t set up planes for F5J, and maybe some strategies, contest strategies, as well as perhaps speculate on the future of this yeah. sport. So. Uh, let's give a little round of applause for Francesco. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you when uh, to flip the yeah. slide, right? That's fine. All right, let's get started. Next slide. Yeah. Right, this is whoops. Too fast. Okay. This, this is the, the famous line, as you <laughs> as you recall, <laughs> from. Uh, so the previous move, so yeah, we don't need no stinking winches. I see F3J as F3J minus the winch. For, of course, for us in the U.S., who use winches. Why is that? Well, we need to figure, we need to recall a little bit of the history of how we how we arrived at the current formula of F3J. So next slide. So the first, there was LMR, limited motor run. So this was an early attempt to replace the winch with something else, like uh, the something else was a winch in the nose. Put uh, a propeller in the nose of your airplane and an electric motor inside, with power probably comparable with uh, the, <laughs> the one that you typically get from a winch. And how do you do that? How, how do you avoid the contest uh, becoming a, a competition of electric aerobatics? You limit the motor run. Only, you can only and put in a 30 second of motor, motor climb. And no, initially there was no other limitation. You can see where this is going. It quickly became an arms race. So there were people who were able to fit up to six kilowatts in, a, in the nose of an, air, of an F3J airplane. And uh, you needed to have custom ESCs because the, the level of voltage and the current that would be required would, would be incredible. And propeller, this is a simple nylon uh, probably fiberglass field uh, propeller, but if you have six kilowatts, you need something stronger. You need uh, carbon fiber propellers. You need probably even uh, handmade by, by, I mean by yourself using molds, because then you control exactly how much carbon tow you put in. So yeah, it didn't, uh, it didn't really get to where the organizer wanted, because uh, it put uh, really a premium on uh, overall efficiency on, of the power plant, and the optimization of the power plant. So it's great if you sell motors, great if you sell batteries or ESCs, and if you're really interested in that part, but if you're really interested in soaring, that's probably not the way to go. So second attempt in the next slide is ALES. So altitude limited electric soaring, not motor run limited. The idea is uh, now that we have electronics and we can, uh, we can easily get an altimeter inside our, our model. Can we invent something to have everybody starting on an equal footing? Yes, for instance, we can decide that everybody can climb up to 200 meters, and then the motor stops. The altimeter automatically stops the motor. So as long as everybody can get to 200 meters in 30 seconds, everybody will start at the same height. 
And the idea is, okay, it's a level playing field. Every, only the, the actual skills of the, the combination of the pilot, uh, air reading skills, and of course, uh, aerodynamic quality of the ship will count. It's affordable because uh, it's not really a demanding task to get to 200 meters with, uh, in 30 seconds. 300, 400 watts are enough. <clears throat> and it's even possible to have a man-on-man -man contest because uh, you can have a, a bunch of people, a battery of people starting at the same time. Eight people launch at the same time, they find, in theory, the same air. And so the, the guy who flies one second more than uh, the other people gets 1,000 points and the other, all the rest uh, in proportion. Next slide. Everything worked until people started looking at the details. And one of the things that, at least in Europe, created lots of discussion was the ability to zoom. Okay, let's say that we all start at 200 meter, meaning that when the altimeter feels that you are at 200 meter, it stops the signal to the ESC, and so your motor stops. But then there is a significant difference whether you just crawl to 200 meters and you have no inertia at that point, or you zoom to 200 meters using uh, 10 kilowatts <laughs> and uh, you, you pass the 200 meter line with, uh, at 100 miles per hour, and just by inertia you zoom another 100 meters. So lots of discussions and arguments of that. In my opinion, it was more of a red herring than a real problem because we have also had space constraints that was not really a, a big issue, but it, in Europe, this determined that the, the category never started. In the US, the category started, and it worked pretty well. I mean, the Sacramento Valley Soaring Society still has a, a regular contest in each month, I believe. In my opinion, the limitation of ALES is a different one. Next slide. So <clears throat> there, is a, there is a concern of score compression. It's even worse than F3J. You, we, you know that in F3J, everybody complains that uh, everybody flies the full time, and everybody lands within 99 and 100 points, and so all the scores are compressed towards the top. It's uh, between the first pilot in the flyoffs and the last pilot that enters the flyoff, maybe there, there's a 1% difference in the scores. Even worse, in my opinion, in, a, in, a, in a ALES, uh, because the, in my opinion, just because the playing field is even too level, the altitude limits, which is usually set, is 200 meters. It's way too high with the ship, with the four-meter ships that we have today. Mm -hmm. It is not really challenging to find it, to find the air. So they tend to become landing contest as soon as the weather is uh, is decent. Um, if we project this at the World Championship level, this will create a, a score compression that. I don't even, can't even imagine how they would be able to score that contest. So it doesn't scale up in a, in, in a way. We need something else. Next slide. So enter FFJ. Uh, I believe the first proposal that I saw was in uh, 2010, was a proposal for a new FAI electric soaring class that made it actually into a provisional class, and now it's, uh, it's an official one. And it's called F5J. So five is the, the prefix that in, FA, in FAI parlance uh, identifies electric, um, electric contest. This is interesting. It was considered by FAI an electric specialty, not a soaring specialty. Otherwise, it would have been F3 something. <clears throat> I think that it was probably mistaken, the classification. Not that it has any consequence, but it, it highlights that people did not exactly know what to expect by then. The first contests were held uh, uh, in the summer of 2011 in Europe, and uh, they really had a good, uh, good success. It quickly increased the number of competitors to the point that now in Europe everybody is uh, whining about uh, the demise of F3J. <laughs> there are no competitors left in the, in the F3J class. Everybody moved to F5. And so this prompted a number of uh, uh, attempts to respond to the situation that last this year led to new rules implemented in the FAI uh, plenary meeting. F3J will have uh, next year, or maybe in the year after the next, will have a mix of uh, winches and uh, two-man towing that is already creating uh, questions. How do you run a contest with the two 
with the two different uh, launching methods at the same time? How do you ensure a fairness in the contest? Because in F3J, every round, you switch uh, uh, the, the landing spot. And so maybe if you, if you start your contest in uh, lane one, which maybe is, a, is, a, is a advantageous because you get to see the air first, because maybe the, the wind comes from, uh, from your side, you need to be able to, okay, second round you'd be in lane two and then lane three and so on. You cannot move winches, it takes half an hour every time. So it's, they don't know what, what they're gonna, how they're gonna save F3J. <clears throat> but it doesn't actually matter because this summer it will be the first FAI European Championship in Bulgaria. And the next year there will be the, the first World Championship in 2019 in uh, Slovakia. And it's, uh, it's kind of a nice circular thing because uh, the very first contest were also held in Slovakia. So nice, they, had, they got this, uh, uh, this uh, acknowledgement from the FAI. Next. So what is F5J? It's a man-on-man -man soaring competition just like uh, F3J. All the competitors in a slot share the same 10 minute working time and they need to do the same kind of spot landing. The difference between F3J is and F5J is that in F3J you get up to 100 point bonus for landing, and in F5J you get maximum 50 points. So there is proportionally less importance attributed to, la to the landing task, which is not bad from a sort of perspective, of course. The, um, where are the differences? Well, of course, launch is by electric motor in the nose. And it's limited to one climb only, you cannot restart, or depending on the rules that you follow, you can restart, but if you do, you forfeit the flight. It's, you get zero points for the, for the entire flight. And you have a maximum of 30 seconds run time. And I underscore maximum, you choose how much you wanna climb in F3J, in F5J. How is that possible? Because the starting altitude gets recorded by an altimeter inside the, that you must have, and must be of an approved type. And the starting altitude is used to assign a handicap to the competitor, a penalty for the, for the flight. How does it work? In the next slide, we'll see. So this, the height penalty is the really interesting thing in F5J. It's the new trick in the F5J rules. So the competitor is free to choose how much to climb during the initial power burst. Uh, you have up to 30 seconds. You can climb as much as you like. However, there's a cost. Every meter that you climb costs you half a point. That is half a second in flight time. Or, if you dare to cross the 200 meter threshold, every meter is gonna cost you three points. So compare this with F3J. F3J also, in a way, has a, a height uh, penalty is determined by the fact that if you spend one second less on tow, you can fly one second more and get one more point. How much altitude do you gain with one second spent on tow? Typically 25 meters. So this means that in F3J, the penalty is equivalent to four hundredths of a point per meter. So it's ridiculous compared to the, <laughs> to the F F5J one. This makes for a different strategy <laughs> for the contest, uh, it makes also for a, for a more interesting contest because uh, you, first of all, you, don't, you are not constrained to fly everybody in the same direction because there's a line that, that determines your direction. You have to launch in the same direction, but then everybody can fly in a different direction, which m makes it much more interesting from a strategy standpoint. You might have seen that there's something uh, brewing uh, far downwind, and you can go right there. And you don't need to give up the altitude. You can fly there with your motor, so using the energy to gain speed instead of gaining altitude. Speed is free. You're not going to pay a penalty for it. Only if you convert it into altitude. Next slide. So of course this requires some technology. Every glider must carry a device that is a combination of a motor limiter, a runtime limiter, I mean, and a uh, uh, recording altimeter. It's actually a very small thing. It's this white thing that 
I have here in the fuselage of this uh, airplane. We're going to pass it. Mm -hmm. So this thing called Altis is the recording altimeter and motor limiter. So you want to move it around? I'll hold it. I'll take it. Oh, <laughs> there. So it must be of an approved type. There are a few of them, I believe five or six currently in production. It's not expensive. This one, I think I paid $70, but there are cheaper ones, there are more expensive ones. They all work essentially the same. This one is convenient, for instance, because it has an integrated display with the OLED technology, so it's really well visible even in, uh, in bright daylight. There are um, types that don't have a display and you need to plug with an external unit. I, I mean, give it, if we give it enough time, we're going to have in maybe in a couple of years models with the Bluetooth technology that you can read from your smartphone. I mean, there's no, that's, that's not important. The important thing is that it's re it records your altitude with a certain precision. And uh, what altitude is recorded? Well, it's recorded as the maximum height attained between the moment that the motor starts and you launch the plane, and 10 seconds after the motor stops. Why this 10 second thing? So I, I'm guaranteed <laughs> to capture any zoom. You know, if you, if you have enough power to zoom for more than 10 seconds under the acceleration of gravity, well, maybe <laughs> you deserve that. Make it a moon Yeah, exactly. Next thing. So this is the way that the, the recording altimeter is typically installed. So it's installed in series between uh, your receiver, the throttle channel of the receiver, and the actual ESC. So very simple like this. It gets the power from, uh, uh, from your system. It intercepts the signal. It lets the signal flow to the motor for the first 30 seconds. And then it sends a, a low signal for, uh, for the rest of the time. So you're not gonna be able to restart. Although there are some models that allow some, some limited form of restart if you accept that you're gonna get zero point for, for the flight. But yours, so you can't turn yours on? Like you, you don't have a way to turn it back on? Uh, in this, uh, with the firmware that I have loaded right now, I can't. But if I, if I loaded the US firmware, then I, I would be able to. But that, that's a topic of a heated discussion because uh, and there are people who believe that the ability to save your plane by, um, by restarting, even if you give up the points, it would encourage you to be more aggressive yeah. and would uh, encourage you to, to take more risk during the flight. Yeah. And people <coughs> who are opposed to this view say, well, in F3J, I actually don't have the option of having a second winch uh, while, if I'm too low. I have to leave the, my model wherever it is. So the, if we want this to be an F3J without winch, we need to have uh, all the rest of the conditions equal to F3J, including the fact that you cannot restart. Mm -hmm. I think that there, my personal opinion, I don't see why not restart. It's a safety issue in the end. Rather than landing in a, uh, landing in a field is fine, but what if you land uh, in somebody's freeway, backyard or really. sorry, the freeway <laughs> or a tree. Well, tree, that's your problem. But <laughs> <laughs> next slide. So, how, what does it mean to compete in an FJ contest? So, what are you going to see in, uh, <clears throat> or what are the considerations that pilots will make before uh, the July contest? Next one. So, the uh, contest is a man-on-man -man contest, so we'll have a number of uh, preliminary rounds, and this number must be more than three, I believe four is the minimum, <coughs> and it, it will be followed by two to four fly-off rounds, just like an F3J contest, essentially. There are preliminaries in which you are using a, a lottery system to, to draw a flight matrix, and so that not everybody we maybe will uh, fly against everybody else, but it doesn't matter because the people who scored the best will uh, compete one-on-one uh, -on -one in, the, in the fly-offs. <coughs> so in each round, the competitors are, will be divided up in separate flight groups. Each group uh, is, uh, is given a slot of 10 minutes. Uh, the, the contest starts at the sound of a beep, 
you the difference between F three J, of course, there's there are no winches, there are no two people. So as soon as you hear the horn, you can you may launch. The rules dictate that you have to launch with your propeller spinning. So you you typically lose half a second or so between the moment that you hear the horn, open the throttle, the propeller spins and you launch. At that point, every second that you fly, even if, if you fly under motor, is, uh, is counted uh, towards your score, is one point, essentially. And of course, the model must land before the end of working time if they want to get landing bonus. So just like in F3J, if you fly if you overfly your slot, you're going to lose uh, your landing bonus. I believe that unlike F3J, there's no penalty. In F3J, you also get a, a 30 points penalty. But if you overfly the group for more than one minute, I believe you also lose the flight at that point. But I mean, we have a... It would be... I don't see under what condition that should be a, should be a factor in, in F3J, given that <laughs> If, you, if you're willing to forfeit the flight, you can always, and you may, maybe you're far downwind, you can always open the throttle and come back. That's not, as long as the battery is not too bad. Next one. The, I think I already mentioned this. The landing modus is proportionate, proportionally less important than it is in F3J and in TD because there is a maximum of 50 points compared to 100 points bonus. And the, it's much more, it's much easier in a way. In F3J, you get 100 points if you land within 20 centimeters, so 80 inches of the, of the landing spot. In, F3, in F5J, you get full bonus if you land within one meter, so it's much bigger. It's, it's, it's that way because you don't want to get the repeller and the motor and everything. It's a little yeah. different. You don't want to just, you can't nose it in, right? No. Right. Well, in theory, yes. In theory, you're right. No, in, no. in practice, uh, there are. Uh, it's. I believe that with the technology that we are using in, uh, maybe not in this one, but in the more modern airplanes and um, and gearboxes, people are less worried about that. So people regularly dork F5J planes, just like they. So it's, it's okay. It's not prohibited in the rules to do that. It's not prohibited, absolutely. But again, you have a big hula hoop worth to get into. Now this one, for instance, as uh, the the output shaft of the gearbox is a six millimeter titanium <coughs> rod, so yeah, it's going to take a while to. Yeah, and what the one meter landing spot, most people don't have to door. Right, right, one exactly. meter. And uh, in preparation for uh, maybe more challenging rules for the future, already there's some manufacturers have come up with uh, some clever ideas, like Vladimir Models, the, the manufacturer of this one has a new model for a, only for FIJ, it's called the PLUS, and has a pusher prop. So the nose is completely free, and you can dork as much as you like. Hmm. Uh, where is it mounted? It's the basically the fuselage is only pod, like this. The propeller is here. And there is, instead of having one uh, tail boom, has a, a twin, oh, twin boom, boom. Twin so boom with an A-shaped... Uh, yes. Yeah. Think about trying to launch that thing with the color spin. Exactly. Mm -hmm. the, the, the rule I heard is you open your funnel just enough to get the thing to turn so it doesn't spread the blade. I guess so. And then slam the throttle open. Yeah. Get it away from you. But it's kind of, I mean, the, the model is in probably an exercise in complication. But yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Kennedy Composites 2195. And oh, there's not a decimal point in there. Oh, that's that's not too bad. Spice used to make one of the lighter, but he made a plane exactly like that yeah. back in the nineties. So one, one meter from the spot is actually a two meter diameter. Circle. That's right. So that's, that's the rate. That's one meter pretty, radius. That's pretty decent. And it, and it drops off by five points for each additional meter. Correct. So it goes 50, 45, 40, so on. That yeah. So does zero. everyone make their Points. Well, there are, uh, I would say, distribution of uh, between 40 and 50, 40, 45, 50. Yeah. Or if you, if you do less than that, it's because you had some problem, essentially, and you couldn't, uh, you were, uh, I don't know, gust of wind uh, set you off, of course, or something like that. And of course, inside the, each of the slots, <coughs> you, sorry, you're going to, 
each pilot will have a score resulting from the flight time, each second is one point, plus the landing bonus, minus the starting height penalty. And uh, within each slot, there will be a norm the score will be normalized to 1,000, and so the assumption is that each slot can be compared to others. If you, if you are the best in your slot, and the best in the next slot, even if you find different air, you're going to both get 1,000. Next one. Typically, the schedule has a uh, five minutes preparation before the, the group's working time. I'm not saying that in July you're going to see that. They may decide that they need more, or they may, they may decide that everything works like uh, just like clockwork, and I'm going to shorten it to three minutes. That depends on the conference director. And in, during preparation, the competitors proceed to their assigned uh, landing spots. At that point, they have to power up the, the models, but I mean the receiver, not the motor, of course. Why is this important? And why it's important that the motor is standing on the, is sitting on the ground at that point? It's important because the altimeter uses that level of barometric pressure as the, the zero altitude. And so the, this will initialize and zero the altimeter. Then uh, competitors wait for working time to start, and uh, hopefully they are trying to read the air and decide what the strategy will be for the launch. <clears throat> and uh, only after the working time starts, competitors may start their motors and launch. I believe I have a video. Let's see. Yeah, let's see the chance. Oh, no, maybe, maybe later. Yeah. What, what is the sound that they listen to just to actually launch? It's typically a horn. I mean, most, most, uh, most contest directors use a program that has a number of samples that you can use, but I believe the horn is the most recognizable one, like an automobile horn. Is, is there a countdown, like five, four, three, two, one? It's, it's not mandatory, but it's considered good form to provide it, yes. Glide score has it. Glide score has it. And uh, again, it's, it's not mandatory to provide the visual uh, clues, but it's good form to have a, a nice big display like the one that uh, Chris Bajorek has, has no, built. We're not, not going to have that in yeah. September and October, folks. <laughs> My my opinion, uh, I think that the only mandatory thing is the at ten second notice, the starting horn, a two minute notice uh, before uh, the end of the working time, and the final horn. But of course, uh, everybody is happier if you can provide the countdown. And Glide Score, I believe it does. Um, well, it's not mandatory to launch at the beginning of working time, although, as you can imagine, everybody would want to do that because uh, every, time, every second that you don't spend in flight is not going to bring you points. Uh, the launch direction, the initial one, is the same for everybody, and it's decided by the contest director. This is done to avoid, uh, of course, crossings and the inevitable collisions. However, once the models are airborne, you can steer your model wherever you like. Of course, trying to avoid other <laughs> other models. The timekeepers are supposed to start the timers when the motor leaves your hand. So, unlike F3J, where time spent uh, attached to the line does not count, count towards your score, time spent uh, under motor does count in F3J. And again, once uh, they are airborne, you can decide where you want to fly. And of course, you can. At that point, you start pursuing your strategy. That's where the, the contest has already started. So you're not constrained by line. You have to, hopefully, you read the air before the, st the, the starting sound, and you know where to go. Next one. And while this happens, competitors typically, either in their mind or on the radio or with their helper, count down from 30 seconds, because after 30 seconds, the motor will stop automatically. And uh, at the same time, they will be reading the air and hopefully also observing what the other competitors are doing. So this has become a part, of, an interesting part of the strategy of the of flight. It's um, reading the air is difficult while you are climbing at 10 meters per second. So uh, people who feel, uh, yep. You say timekeeper, so there's a timer for each pilot. 
Well, if you're on a contest by the book, yes, you should add one time key. So okay. timer. Um, clock two. As far as where the other competitors are in the air, yes. The, the, the issue is this: if the if you're running a big contest and you have official timekeepers like uh, people from the local flight club, yep. they are not required to tell you anything, but they may do it if they if they want to help you. Yes. If you but in, in smaller contest, probably your timer is also your helper, yep. so certainly is going to help you. Are you allowed to have, if there's official timers, are you allowed to have a helper? With yes, you? you are. One okay. helper. Uh, I have a question on that time, too. It's quite obvious, but it's almost like the way this is done, you could almost eliminate a, a timekeeper, and, but you can't because the timer is part of landing. And all that Very works. good. It's the landing is the problem. Because the just like the rules for F3J, the, the, the timer is supposed to stop. He's a judge, too. Yeah. yeah. The timer is supposed to stop at your first contact with the ground or with an object rigidly connected to the ground. So if you, if you graze at the top of the tree, that should stop your, your timer. If you, <laughs> I mean, I've seen people <coughs> come in, they were running late, and so they would not have come, arrived at the spot within the, the flight time. So what they did, is to dive fast, touch the ground at the point that the timer stops, and then, with all, the, with perfectly calm, land on the spot because at that point they are no longer on the clock. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, with this kind of vari variability, it's hard to have an automated system that recognizes that. If I dork, if all the landings were dorks, that would be easy. You put an accelerometer and you detect the, the moment of landing. But if you do a grazing landing, it's much harder to get. Good answers. Thank you. Uh, so um, it was, I think I was talking about the strategy. So it's hard to read the air if you're flying at, uh, if you're climbing at 10 meters per second. The tendency that I see is that people initially have a direction that they already know that they want to go. They might have identified a spot that they, they like to, to try far away. So they may have maybe five seconds of a fast horizontal flight to get there. Then they reduce the throttle to a bare minimum not to stop the motor. And they start reading the air. They start feeling what's there. If they don't find anything, maybe after 10 seconds, they open, they fully open the throttle and they climb maybe at 20 meters per second to gain as much altitude uh, as they can because they, they, their strategy didn't work, so they are, they're going to try to, mm -hmm. to get as much as they can from the situation. Oh, so it's not a full throttle flight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the control of the throttle. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is why... I sorry? I don't know anything about this. This is all new to me. <laughs> yeah, well, when, we, when, this, um, when this class has started, People were actually debating whether you needed a, a throttle control or you just needed a, a two-position switch on and off. Well, if you want to do that kind of thing, you need to have a proportional throttle control because uh, you need to be able to reduce the throttle and feel the air and open it again. And that's all in 30 seconds. It's only 30 seconds. So if you want to climb quickly, I mean, I've seen some friends of mine in Europe have uh, power plants that can give them up to 25 meters per second, so that if they don't find anything, it's only going to take them uh, five, eight seconds to climb from zero to 200 meters. So it's always uh, it, so it's evolving. So uh, power still matters. Yeah, <laughs> power still matters more, and it's uh, it's interesting because initially <coughs> it mattered nothing. And now it's climbing up on the important <laughs> scale. <laughs> so yeah, strategies may vary. One can decide to climb fast and shut down, or a speed horizontally with a shallow rate of climb, or any combination of these. And of course, this will dictate your requirements for the power plant. Next. So yeah, once the motor is stopped, it can be restarted. Consider this with an asterisk. It cannot be restarted unless you want to lose your flight. Yeah. And at that point, 
Once the motor is stopped, given that you cannot uh, have it back, uh, it's a plain thermal duration task. You have to find the uh, uh, thermals to stay aloft. <coughs> and given that not all competitors may find uh, the thermal, and uh, they may have chosen a different uh, uh, starting height, not all competitors may be able to complete their working time. This makes, it, makes the contest very interesting because uh, it essentially eliminates, I mean, reduces the possibility or the risk of having the strong the score compression because there will always be somebody that has chosen to go too high and will pay a higher price for the, for the altitude or somebody that has chosen to stop too low and will not be able to complete the time. So we'll not get the 600 points from the flight. Just like in F2J, when a competitor lands, he must do so within 75 meters of the assigned landing spot, or the score is zero. And the model must land before the end of the working time, of course. The difference, <coughs> with another difference with F3J happens when the motor, when the, the model is, uh, has landed. Your timekeeper or your helper must then reach into the fuselage and read the display, either directly or using an external display. But your starting altitude must be recorded on, recorded on your scorecard. Uh, only write down the meters. Somebody else will make will, will do the math and uh, translate it into points. So I can say feet. <laughs> Just no, no, I, <laughs> I don't. I haven't seen uh, any. A recording altimeter no, with, a, with a USB. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> next one. So, if I compare it with an F3J or a TD contest, well, just like uh, F3J is a real man on man contest with everybody in the same group flying uh, the same air. <laughs> Maybe not exactly the same air if they decided to go in a different direction, but they fly in the same weather pattern at least. So it's fun. And it's much easier to run than F3J. There are no teams required because you don't need to have people towing you or people operating the winch. So there's no need for team protection. Everybody in principle can fly against anybody else. The, logistically speaking, it's incredibly easier because you don't need to have the turnarounds or the tow people 500 feet down the line. So your field still needs to be wide enough to accommodate maybe eight or 10 parallel lines, but it doesn't need to be that long. And one of the things that are, another difference with F3J, in F3J it's kind of easy to understand how things are going. You see a guy landing, the guy is, pro is probably, <coughs> is gonna get a low score. And you see a guy landing, uh, sorry, landing before the end of working time. You see that all the people are landing at the same time at the end. Well, chances are they're going to get similar scores. Not so, not so in F5J. It's hard to tell what's going on just by looking at what the competitors are, are, are doing. You need to look at the, at the scores. So it, the strategy is a little bit more challenging. Next one. So this is an example of what you could see in a, in a scorecard. <coughs> Sorry, it's, it's a math problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So competitor A flew for 9 minutes 58.3 seconds and started uh, at 180 meters and landed, uh, not perfectly, let's say 40, 40 points. So 180 meters will cost uh, this competitor 90 points. So the raw score is uh, 550, sorry, 598.3 plus 40 minus 90, 548. That's the raw score. What, what about the other competitors? Well, competitor B uh, only flew 7 minutes 22 seconds, but stopped his motor at 150 meters. And also got 40 points for landing. So if I do the math, this competitor has a 407.5 points raw score. <laughs> But now, here is how things get interesting. Competitor C didn't fly entirely the working time. It landed at 8 minutes 40 seconds, but he started the motor at, and he stopped the motor only at 40 meters. And uh, maybe he did a good landing, 50 meters, uh, sorry, 50 points. 
So his aggregate score is 550. He's actually higher than competitor A, who apparently, I mean, he, has a, he flew all the entire time, so you would say that he, he won. He actually didn't. Competitor C won, and everybody else got in proportion. And competitor D was also, also managed almost mm -hmm. to beat the other guy, despite the fact that he flew almost the same time, started the, stopped the motor 10 meters higher, but he did something that he did a slightly better in the landing task. And this applies to each individual slot in each individual round. Yep? The raw score is on. <coughs> seems close, but yet is that a normalized score in S2? Yes, the, the, that's the normalized score. So the highest score conventionally gets 100 normalized points and everybody else in proportion. I mean 1,000. Yeah, sorry, what did I say? 100. Oh no, 1,000, sorry. Next. So this is a real score, score chart from, uh, from one of the first contests in uh, 2011. And Gee, who won that one? No, no, this was, uh, was not the final one. No. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> uh, you see the, each of the rounds, there's a one, uh, there's actually more people with a 1,000 because uh, each round uh, had five slots. So you see one, sorry, four. One, two, three, four thousands in uh, round one. One, two, three, four, five in uh, round two. One, two, three, four, five in round three, and so on. And in the end, you sum everything. This is nothing new. It's just like F3J. And glider score does this for you. <laughs> Next one. So this is interesting. I tried to. I took the. In this particular contest, it was a four-day uh, soaring festival in Slovakia. We flew F5J <coughs> Thursday and Friday, and F3J <coughs> Saturday and Sunday. <clears throat> and this is the, the statistical distribution of the scores at the end of the preliminary rounds. In F3J, you see, this, is a, this distribution has a peak around the, the maximum score, essentially. So it's, it's hard. They are uh, fairly compressed, as you can see. In the next slide, this is the distribution in the F5J contest. So you see the... The median is not the highest score. This, this is also, sorry, not the, the median. The mode is not the highest score, which makes it more, uh, in my opinion, makes for a more interesting contest. I haven't done the same uh, kind of analysis for a more recent contest, but now that we have an, a US tour for F, F5J2, it would be interesting to do it. <coughs> As uh, Joe Wurtz would say, air reading is everything. So it's all about air reading, even more so than F3J. The, the starting height, if you're a glider pilot, you know that in every, in, I mean, full scale, you know that you have to imagine at, all, at any time that there is a cone under your, uh, <coughs> under your airplane, and you can, you'll be able to land if nothing happens, if you don't find a thermal at any point inside that cone. And you're never going to be able to reach points outside your cone. And the, 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 the aperture of that cone is your gliding light ratio. In F5J, you have to do the same kind of, a, of a exercise. And the starting height, therefore, determines not only how long the model will fly before <laughs> getting to the ground, but also how wide will be this cone of a ground that you can explore, the, the, this explorable air mass. So a pilot will start to, to wonder, OK, how many thermals per acre can this day produce? Is it a stable? Uh, do we have a stable gradient or an unstable gradient? Is it, in other words, if I get a parcel of air that gets hotter because uh, maybe it's on, a, on, a, on, a, on, the, on the dark pavement and it starts as a rising, will it continue rising or will it find a thermal inversion and it will stop? And if it rises, well, Will the rise of strong or, or weak? So these are the kind of uh, questions that full-scale glider pilots ask <coughs> from their <coughs> weather analysis. And in F5J, this will become, uh, I believe it will become the norm. 
So part of the strategy also is, uh, do I choose to climb under motor or to cover ground? Have I spotted signs of lift uh, far downwind? So I want, I want to do a bump down and uh, fly mm -hmm. far downwind to get it. Or uh, I, I prefer to, it's not really clear, so I prefer to fly slow and see what's, what's available. These are all choices that it, the pilot will, will have to make. Again, if you're doing, if you're launching with a winch, you don't have that. You have to fly in the direction that the winch is set. You, you don't have that, that option. This makes for a more interesting strategy in the contest. Next. Okay, so this is a, this is a still picture, of course, of the starting of a contest. You see here the timer, 9.58, so the contest has just started. This is a countdown. And uh, the pilots are happily climbing under under motor. So this is a picture of a contest that I believe was held in 2012. You can tell by the fact that they are all climbing pretty steep. I understand that now, in, if you have a, in a contest in Europe this summer, everybody was climbing, barely climbing, because they wanted to read the air. There's a video that you can find that's very interesting in that regard. And they stop very low like stopping at 20 meters. Wow. Next. Well, this is Joe Wirtz, who competed, uh, I believe won, the F5J contest, uh, the first the one that they held in, that Vladimir, Vladimir's model held in Ukraine in uh, 2014. I believe this was uh, actually taken in Ukraine. I see a Ukrainian flag that I'm up there. And uh, Joe Wirtz is flying this session this type of model. That was before he created this uh, the plus model with the, with the twin boom. Next. This is a landing, as you can see. Yes, people do dark, especially if the ground is soft. <laughs> Next. Is there any, any marker? You can't go, oh, I see a tape. You can it's a little bit of tape, is that it? Uh, to the right of the yellow model. Oh yeah, there's a tape. Oh yeah, the tape is here. Okay, so yeah, it's just yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it's hard to tell because the the grass the grass was uh, high. But it looks like Joe is landing right here. Yeah. Mm, body English is very important. Okay. Next. Uh, this is probably a video. Let me see if, I, if we can start it. Might be that it's on your stick. No, don't tell me. No, no, no. Very good. Yeah. So this is the preparation time before. Uh, a contest in um, in the Aids. Maybe you can volume. Oh, it's already. As you can see, people launch with uh, easy gliders or uh, what is it, a Radian, not easy glider, sorry. And that is a Maxa, not mine. You see what the guy is doing? Is flying horizontally, mm -hmm. and the other guys are climbing like mad. Different strategies. And so the, I think the video is uh, so next. Yeah, let's go to the next one, which I believe is a landing. Yeah. That's the spot. goes to the plane, measures the distance, and now we should open the canopy and uh, read the altimeter. Okay, we didn't do it. I think there's probably another one. Yeah. This is my plane. Oh, oh sorry. Okay. Yeah, so you open. And uh, this is the refresh rate of the display playing tricks with uh, the camera. But you see, 155.5 meters. That would be my starting uh, starting height. And next. So I probably already mentioned this. The altimeter must be initialized with the model <coughs> on the ground. 
and we'll record the maximum height between the moment the motor is started and 10 seconds after the motor is stopped. And uh, should be read by the tank keeper, either with an internal display that's nicer on the tank on the tank keeper. Otherwise, there are some devices that require you to plug an external display so that you don't need to fly with the display. Uh, that was probably when the displays were large LCDs. Now they use an uh, OLED technology. It's much uh, easier to read and uh, small too. So powerful. Yeah. So the, the altimeter is also a data logger. So they record actually what you do. This is the output, the graphical output of, uh, of my logger in one of my flights. So the, the pink line is actually the, the throttle channel. And the, the, green, the, the green chart is the, of course, the height. So the program already automatically puts markers in correspondence of what I do. I turn on the motor. So you see the throttle channel going all the way up. The motor climbs at about 10 meters per second. And then at some point, I decided to switch the motor off. And uh, between this moment, which is about uh, 70, probably 71 sorry, seconds, and uh, 81 seconds, the altimeter records the maximum height. And you see in that point, the peak F5J alt, the altitude, 174.0 meters. Now in this particular flight, I was using uh, the, the version, the US version of the firmware. So you see it says throttle rearmed. So at, after 10 seconds, I can restart the motor if I'm uh, in desperate need. But of course, uh, the, the altimeter will record this fact and will show it to the timekeeper so that my score will be zero. Next. These are some examples of uh, uh, approved devices. Uh, this is the Altus, the one that I'm using. This is the Altus V4. This is the Altus V3, which required an external display. This is, this is the RC Basic. And this, that's the external display. And this is the sky limit with its external display. There are a number of them. Uh, and the prices are more or less uh, similar between $70 and 100 This was a couple of years back. Maybe now they are even cheaper. Yeah, the Altus now for about 65 65 Yeah, the latest version. So I like the Altus because it's, uh, it's, everything is uh, contained in one unit. I don't, there's no external display. And I, I mean, it never gave me a problem, it's reliable. It's, uh, one important thing is that it's your device. If it doesn't work, it's your problem. <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't record correctly, it's just like uh, having, a, having a, one of your servos going bad. From the contest director perspective, you don't get it in flight time. Question? Yep. In a contest, would it be a good idea to have two, one in the plane, and if it for some reason stops Fails, working, yeah. you can swap. Yeah, it would be, uh, although it's not exactly easy to swap them in the crammed fuselages of, uh, of these airplanes. But yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Next. All right, set, setting up an F5J sailplane. So there are different options. Uh, let's go to the next one. So. And this is a little bit, uh, this hasn't aged too well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's true that virtually anything which is good for ERDS or uh, electric thermal duration is also suitable for F5J. It's technically true. However, if you want to be competitive today, I don't know in the US, but in Europe, you need to have very lightweight airplanes. And when I say uh, there is a, a minimum uh, wing loading that the FAI has always mandated and the minimum loading was 12 grams per square decimeter and nobody ever cared about that because it was impossible to build the planes that light. Well, not anymore. Now, if you want to be in compliance, you have to carry ballast. <laughs> so it means uh, we're talking about something like uh, 1,090 grams for a 4-meter airplane. 
how many ounces is that? Uh, it's it's, it's, it's a 30, say 30, 30, 40, 30, 30, 35. Uh, that, yeah. That, Boom, boom thing. Yeah. Kennedy advertises it as bare air frame weight, weight 24 ounces, ready to fly weight 32 ounces. Yeah. Yeah, I know there were, there were guys wow. that did, at the last contest that he had that was in the 40 ounce category. It was, it's amazing. I mean, these are huge airplanes. Was it 35? Maybe it was 35. They, but they don't need the strength for the winch, right? So they can make them lighter. Right. Exactly that. Yeah. So exactly. for the first uh, five years, I would say. People have taken uh, F3J airplanes like this one and uh, have uh, repurposed them for F5J. And starting last year, a new generation of airplanes is coming out that they were designed without the constraints of the winch in mind. So spars are small. They, of course, they wouldn't withstand uh, even a, a mile the winch launch. But and the price is high. And the price is high because also they are using uh, some of uh, these exotic materials like uh, non-woven carbon fiber, etc. So yeah, it's a good idea to be light. It's also a good idea to be able to carry ballast because uh, conditions are not always the same throughout the flight. So I don't know if you know this, but this airplane has a ballast tube here. Although this is a 65 ounce uh, <coughs> plane, so... In Europe, they would consider me crazy to fly with this, but yeah. <laughs> I, it wasn't that bad. In uh, last year, I competed with this airplane in the in the Brigantino F F5J contest, and I ended up fourth against uh, this uh, new generation of planes that was uh, was coming out. I'm pretty sure that this year, with the pilot having had one more year to practice with those uh, light machines, I wouldn't be that competitive. Flying with a light airplane is not that easy, as we all know, because uh, it's uh, you are much more uh, much more sensitive to external disturbances from the wind, from turbulence. So what do you fly, fly now? I, I still uh, fly this way. Yeah, I really I discovered that I'm not really good at flying uh, light airplanes. I I get really frustrated when I see that the model doesn't do what I want, but does what the wind tells it to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But anyway, there are, um, oh yeah, the batteries, I never mentioned that, sorry. Uh, the battery can only needs to last for one flight. You can recharge the battery as much time as you like, you can, have, you can use as many batteries as, as you like. So this is the battery that I currently use. It's an 850 milliamp hour 3S LiPo battery, so I, I believe it's probably 80 grams, and it's it lasts for about uh, three climbs, but I try to recharge it after each climb. <coughs> and if you, yeah, you, two or even just one climb out of a single charge is sufficient. And you don't want to, uh, there's no, nobody carries uh, an external battery just for the receiver. We all use a DEC. And so if, if the battery dies, your plane is, is doomed, so you don't want to, to play too close to the, to the limit. The chances are if you launch, you probably hit stop. You yeah, exactly. play it probably. Yeah. It's also good to have a spare. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's another one here in the, in the LiPo safe. Yep. Because it, especially if you, the flight is uh, 10 minutes, last five minutes of preparation time. You're not going to be able to recharge it in 15 minutes. Right. You need to have a few batteries to sign yeah, up. Back up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So this is my sailplane. <coughs> it's a max of four, four meters. Electra. It has the same wind that I already use for uh, F3J. And the electric version only weighs one ounce more than the F3J version. Because the fuselage is lighter. And actually, if you think about it, I think that my power plant is uh, um, 90 grams. And uh, in my F3J plane, I have a, a four, uh, four elements uh, nickel metal hydrate battery. It's, it's 120 grams. So in the end, uh, if, you, if you use lighter servers, you're going to make up for the difference. Not, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be much, uh, much heavier. I use, uh, of course, a brushless motor. It's an in-runner with a 5-to-1 planetary gearbox. 
and I use a Castle Creation 35 amp ESC that also has a, um, a switching 5 amp, 5 amp continuous BEC. And all this spins uh, an Aeronaut uh, 14 by 8 uh, propeller with the battery that I showed you. It's a 3S850 milliamp hour LiPo. It's capable of a 65C discharge. And uh, what I measured for this airplane was uh, when, I, when the battery is fully charged before I release the sort of standing on the ground full uh, static thrust and it draws about 40 amps. So I'm actually exceeding the, the ESC spec, but only for a, a couple of seconds. And it doesn't seem to mind too much. Not that, not that I would advocate for it, but yeah. So I always, I, I never liked gearboxes. Uh, in the old days, uh -huh. I always thought we would go to just a direct drive type situation. You know, get the right size of propeller and the right engine, the right so motor. If you, you, want, uh, you want to spin a large propeller for efficiency, uh, because the disc, that your exactly. the that, that, yeah, the, that your propeller will move is larger. So if you want to spin a large propeller, you need to have low KV, so low RPMs per volt. And there are two ways to achieve this. Either with an in-runner with a gearbox or with an out-runner motor. The problem with out-runners is that they don't fit in these fuselages. Oh, yeah. okay. So it's I mean, some of them do, but it's, uh, it's more complicated, of course. Yeah. A size problem. It's a size problem, absolutely. Next one. Yeah, this is the airplane. You have the fuselage here, and that's the complete airframe. I believe uh, we, I have another small video. No. This is the power plant. <coughs> this is the Bryson Hour 5 to 1 gearbox. The motor is a Chinese uh, thing. I believe it's uh, marketed for uh, direct drive for uh, um, EDF. And in this case, it's used, of course, with a, with a, with a gearbox because uh, it spins too fast. And that's the Talon 35 uh, Castle ESC. Next. This is the, the same fuselage with the battery in it. There's not much room left. And you see here the, ba the ballast tube, the opening of this. There are the two servos. One is underneath the Altis, this is the other one, this is the receiver, and the ESC is stuck here in the nose. Next. <coughs> yeah, uh, initially the, we thought that performance would not be a concern in F5J, it's not like mod, uh, LMR, but it's becoming increasingly a factor in uh, the strategy of the contest because uh, I, I mentioned this already, being able to quickly cover ground to reach a promising spot is important. And for uh, better air reading, some pilots want to climb slowly so they can see what the, uh, the reactions of the model are. And uh, the, maybe if they don't find anything, they need to be able to climb very quickly, like uh, 50 to 60 feet per second to, in the last few seconds to save uh, what's still most impossible to save. Next. Uh, this is uh, some uh, electrical measurements. I have, uh, I have an onboard system that records uh, voltage and, uh, and current during, uh, during the motor run. So this uh, light blue graph is the altitude. The red one is current and the dark blue one is voltage. As you can see, I have how much? 40, 40 something amps in the initial burst. Then it quickly drops, of course and uh, as the voltage is also dropping. And uh, it, when the, the voltage recover, recovers quite slowly, you can see. So I start with the 12.5 volts, and I probably end uh, at uh, 11.5, so I, I don't lose one, one volt. Yeah, I mean, this battery is, you need to monitor the battery periodically. Some of you may remember that I had built uh, a small device to measure the internal resistance of the, of the individual cells because you want to be able to spot problematic cells before they become a problem in flight. <laughs> because your plane depends on that. Next one. Oh, this is a, a small video. This gives you the idea of the, how fast it climbs. Not very fast.
It doesn't really climb vertical. It's probably a 45 degrees ramp, in the, between us eight and 10 meters per second. Now, how to run an FFJ contest? You may find it interesting. <laughs> Okay, let me <laughs> so, uh, how many pilots will be able to accommodate in a single slot will be determined by the size of the field. Because you need to put the, landings, the launching and landing spots 15, at least uh, 15 meters apart from each other. So, 50 feet. Only four at okay. Brigantina? Yeah. Okay. Four. And of course, you may not be, if the, if the field is not square, like Brigantino, uh, the direction that you're going to lay the, the spots depends on the prevailing wind. And I guess that in the case of Brigantino, we're going to have to put them on the, on the narrow side, right? Yeah. 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 You have to go on the long run. <laughs> the opposite of what you need for the Correct. For a winch slot. <laughs> yeah. But of course, the, this, uh, given that, uh, let's say that we, if we have a, if you can accommodate four spots, and let's say you have uh, 50 entries, you're gonna have to run 12, uh, spot, 12 slots per round. It's a lot, it will take a long time to do it, so I don't know. Um, so depending on that, you may need a, a one day or two day contest, but you already know that in your case it would be a two day contest. Typically, you're gonna fly one full day on, uh, on the first day, half a day on the second with a stop for lunch and after lunch you're gonna run the flyoffs maybe two or three rounds you're gonna have to mark the, the landing spots and put uh, landing tape for each of them uh, there's actually not much uh, else that you have to set on the field except for the audio system now I know that uh, Chris Bajoric has a system that he connects it to glider score that broadcasts the audio on a, like some uh, FM frequency, and uh, he uses uh, actually uh, radios, FM radios uh, dispersed a lot around the field, so that each competitor has a radio in uh, next to the landing spot. So to avoid this is, avoids the propagation delay of sound if the field is very long. Uh, we have two speakers that sit on top of my car. <laughs> That's pretty high tech. So you're gonna have to prepare once once all the entries once you once you lock down the contest and the, all the entries have been received, you're gonna have to prepare the the flight matrix, and it can be purely random. But I believe that Lado Score also helps you in doing that, so mm -hmm. that shouldn't be a concern. In F2J, it was much more complicated because there are, there are things like team protection. Typically, you don't need that in FIJ. Yeah, but I just want to know this for team protection if you yeah. want to use it. Next one. <clears throat> yeah, so you need to provide either audio or visual signals for the start of preparation time, the start of working time, the two minute marker to the end of the working time, and the end of the working time. Everything else is uh, extra. So. Some people run it with a computer, some people run it with a CD that just has the, the soundtrack for one round in, in it and they play it uh, continuously with a continuous repeat. If you use, a, of course, if you use Glidoscore, you need to have a computer, so you might as well use it for the generation of the audio signals. Uh, a printer is useful for, uh, if you want to provide the printouts uh, after each round. With, um, I would dispute that because uh, exactly because uh, it's hard to understand uh, how things are going just by looking at the flights. People will want to know how, how, is, the, how is the contest going. And uh, the only way to, either they are going to look at your display screen or they want to look at printouts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, need my, I guess I need a bigger AC. Converter. I'm going to bring my HP printer along with me. Well, that's a generator. Huh? Well, generator. That's a generator. Or the pilots can have a smartphone. And the uh, glider, the glider score can be set up with a no, Wi-Fi. No, no, no. no. <laughs> right? No, no. So, well, no, it's, so it's, just an email. The score is in. 
components is that set up to send anything out to a phone? Uh, so glider score, I understand, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it can also be run in the cloud. So you can upload it to the cloud uh, each round if you have a working internet connection so that the pilot can uh, look at as uh, yeah. uh, Randy pointed out. But that requires uh, to have an uh, internet connection. So I well, but all, all the smartphones have a hotspot in them in today's world. They do, but is there cell, co cell coverage uh, where you're going to fly? I think we do have. Yes, we have great cell coverage. Okay, yeah. then yes. Yeah, it could be done. It's just the range of the, 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 the hot spot isn't yeah. what it is for the router. Yeah. But you don't, you don't even need a, I mean, if you have a, you don't need a hot spot. I mean, if the computer may rely on a hot spot, but then the individual competitors don't need to connect there. How, like, my computer, how you use a Wi Fi? For your computer, you don't, you don't, yeah. Yeah, you don't need it for the, you the competitors have their own smartphone. Because they've got smartphones that yeah. doesn't need yeah. a hotspot. Yeah. So that goes to the cloud and then back to you uh, through the, to the hotspot. Well, that's for storing. Well, they, they have to be able to see the scores too, so we're not going to print them. Right. They can see them on their smartphones. And that's, that also is an option uh, for entering the scores. Yeah. I mean, the traditional way is to print out scorecards, but I saw people that uh, do it uh, with, um, with via the web. So each competitor enters their scores. Yeah, by, by the score will print out cards that are compatible with using the hotspot. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's not like we have to do this Wi-Fi hotspot thing. Or, you know, what we're yeah. going to do for our club contest, I don't think we need. It. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I would consider that the icing on the cake, not necessarily by any means. Right. What would be useful if uh, Chris is open to to landing it is the the display. He has a big LED display that competitors would find really useful. Yeah, you can buy it on the web too. Buy yes, but I think I mean two hundred some odd bucks. <laughs> it's a nice, and then you have to assemble. Oh yeah. And the computer needs to be able to drive it, so I don't know if it needs so a serial it, or USB. I think it drives off USB port. Okay. Uh, next one. No, oh, that <laughs> that was the last one. So, okay. <clears throat> I I hope it didn't scare anybody off the idea of flying it just because now there are light models. Actually, what I wanted to show you is that there's people who make these things. This is basically a, a firewall that you can use to retrofit an, your existing F3J plane by cutting the nose and, and gluing that in. Yeah. It's a CNC machine from, uh, from aluminum, they are commercial, they are people sell them. Different sizes, I suppose. Yeah, different sizes, uh, different uh, motor bolt patterns. This one is a four, four bolt, I have also a three bolt. And who makes that? Um, I would say it writes an hour, but I'm sure that there are is this a fellow that sells on RC groups? Yeah, for yeah. sure. And I'm sure that there are people yeah, okay. in, uh, in the U.S. who, who sell them. Well, that's a firewall. I made a couple of yeah. things I wanted to do, but I was never satisfied with what I came up with a firewall. Yeah, this is uh, a good, These are nice. CNC. CNC. Yeah. 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 Y